Hello and welcome to this Unit 1 video lecture. This lecture is meant to supplement the unit reading, which is Chapter 2 of Thomas Martin's Ancient Greece. In this unit, we begin in the Bronze Age, and we'll be examining the broader Mediterranean and Near Eastern civilizations to give some sense of how ideas and cultural components can travel across time and across geographical space. So while Greece is here, we will be beginning our look at those influences, those profound influences on Greek civilization that develop here in Egypt, uh, Anatolia, or Asia Minor, as it was called, and certainly uh, the birthplace of civilization, Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates. Now, as we explore the topics and themes for this Bronze Age unit, my hope is that you will recognize some similarities with our own globalized age. That is because during the mid to late Bronze Age, uh, we will see several regional civilizations competing with one another for economic and geopolitical dominance, while at the same time, uh, these regional powers will become increasingly interdependent as they all become enmeshed in a very sophisticated network of trade and diplomacy. So sometimes what is old is new again, and what is new we can trace back to uh, earlier periods of history. And while we certainly don't know a lot about Bronze Age Greece, uh, we can piece together enough to recognize a certain familiarity. Now, as far as the timeline goes, uh, I don't want to take us back too far because uh, we only have a limited time frame which, which to accomplish certain goals. So we'll be beginning right around here, the middle uh, Bronze Age period, okay, yeah, where my timeline is. And we'll be taking this unit through to the late Bronze Age and on the cusp of the age that follows, uh, which will be first a Dark Age and then an Iron Age, all right? So that's our time frame and geographical uh, location. So many of you are aware that uh, civilization begins here uh, sometime around 3500 BCE. And again, this is Mesopotamia. But as people interact, the components of civilization are going to migrate. In this case, we are going to look at a westward migration. And uh, we'll look at the first Aegean-based civilization called the Minoans. And uh, the Minoans are going to develop on this island here, the island of Crete. And you will notice uh, the Mediterranean Sea is clearly marked in this particular map. Well, the Aegean, where a lot of our story will be taking place, is this sea here, in which you have uh, what will become Greece and across uh, the sea is Asia Minor, nowadays Turkey, and we have Crete to the south, and a bunch of little islands that are going to be called the Cyclades Islands. All right, so each of these will play a role in our story. Uh, certainly uh, Crete will be prominent as we begin to explore what becomes known as Minoan culture. And uh, of course my color code here indicates some of the main players that are going to be uh, certainly in place by the 14th century BCE. So that's roughly from 1400 to 1300 BCE. But we are going to uh, draw the clock back, as I indicated earlier, uh, a little bit further back uh, so we get to around 2000 BCE. So in this case, the Minoans are the focus of this lecture. Now, uh, the Minoans themselves uh, are not going to be uh, considered Greek. And even though they aren't uh, considered Greek, they do uh, perform a crucial service in providing some profound cultural influences that will help shape uh, the earliest form of Greek civilization uh, called the Mycenaean Greeks. So what we'll see here is because of Crete's central location, central uh, to the regional players that I've just pointed out to you, We'll see how the island of Crete is going to act as a type of cultural conduit, bringing a lot of ideas into Greece itself. 
So we'll begin our story again around 2200 BCE on the island of Crete where uh, civilization is well underway. Now a word on the term civilization. Uh, civilization involves the establishment of permanent dwelling areas that we call today cities as opposed to villages. Now the difference is quite significant. Agricultural villages had existed all over the place throughout the late Stone Age but as the Bronze Age begins, and of course, when we talk about moving from Stone Age to Bronze Age, we're talking about what type of instruments and implements people used for weapons, tools, and farming, uh, that sort of thing. So as we move away from stone being the predominant material towards the use of bronze, and of course bronze is a mixture of copper and tin, as we move into the Bronze Age and civilization begins to develop, we move away from villages to cities, and the crucial difference between the two is that a city contains a number of people who do not provide for their own support. That is to say, they don't produce food. They're not involved in the agricultural process. This is a population that needs to acquire food from somebody else. So we're looking at a group or groups of people that do various things like govern or belong to a priestly class or are bureaucrats or craftspeople that are not engaged in the actual day-to-day -day routine of farming. And that is what uh, we're going to see emerge on the island of Crete sometime around uh, 2000 BCE. Now, the peoples living on Crete back in the Bronze Age, uh, certainly didn't refer to themselves as Minoan. It is a modern label that's applied by the first major archaeologist to begin excavating on the island of Crete. His name was Arthur Evans, Sir Arthur Evans, and he, like a lot of the archaeologists of the late 19th and early 20th century, was very much enamored of the ancient Greek myths. And one of the more prominent myths, of course, was that of King Minos, uh, of the island of Crete. And based upon the myth of King Minos, Arthur Evans in 1899 purchased a tract of land on the island of Crete. And uh, after a year's excavation, he had unearthed uh, palace ruins. And we'll talk more about this term palace, but let's just say very vast and extensive building structures at uh, a site called Canossos. And this site covered about five acres. And the size and the splendor of these findings indicated that Canossos had indeed been an ancient cultural capital. And, of course, Evans associated the complex ground plan of the palace uh, with King Minos and uh, the notorious labyrinth built to house uh, a mythical creature called the Minotaur, uh, half bull, half man. So based upon this, this myth and what uh, Evans had found, uh, he, Evans, decided to label the culture that he was excavating as Minoan. Now, Minoan civilization is very much mysterious to us, in part because although we have recovered, uh, thanks again to Arthur Evans and others, other subsequent archaeologists, we have recovered uh, clay tablets, hundreds of them, upon which is written a script but we have not yet deciphered that script, and the Minoan script is referred to as Linear A. Now, a little later on, we'll be looking at a derivative script known as Linear B, uh, which is, uh, has been found to be the earliest form of uh, Greek. So Linear A, which uh, is believed to have been used by the Minoans, has not been deciphered, so we don't know what linguistic family uh, the Minoans belong to, while Linear B has been defined uh, as the earliest form of Greek. But the similarity between Linear A and Linear B is that uh, archaeologists uh, note in the case of Linear B, which we have deciphered, and they assume for Linear A, that both of these scripts tend to be bureaucratic, administrative scripts, in part uh, because the Minoan society, as we'll see in a moment, was based on an economy of redistribution in which the ruling class had to keep a careful record of agricultural and other goods that came into this extensive palace complex in order to be redistributed back out to the population. 
depending on whatever formula the ruling class had in place as far as who gets what. Now, the Minoans, although not Greek themselves, are going to be important as establishing the model for the later Greeks as to how an advanced civilization should be organized. Now, the archaeological evidence clearly indicates that for two centuries, from about 1650 to 1450 BCE, an enormous amount of cultural borrowing took place as the first Greeks appropriated everything from economic organizational methods to record keeping uh, to uh, similar artistic styles. Now, the second point has to do with an imperial concept known as Thalassocracy. For the ancient Greeks, the Minoans represented the early pioneers in the creation of a Thalassocracy, a sea-based empire. And the ancient Greek historians that you and I will be looking at throughout this course, uh, Herodotus and Thucydides, they certainly gave credit to King Minos and the Minoans for creating a sea-based empire, thereby controlling maritime commerce and making the Minoans wealthy and powerful despite their relatively small size when compared to their land-based neighbors. So, by establishing a Thalassocracy, Minoans were able to project political and economic influence far beyond Crete. There is even a belief that some of the emerging Greek cities uh, were required to pay tribute to the Minoans. And this may be the basis for the Minotaur myth, in which you have a Greek hero named Theseus who travels to Crete and slays the powerful Minotaur. And that could very much be symbolic of how the Greeks, as they became more powerful, were able to throw off the shackles of Minoan dominance. So this concept of Thalassocracy lived on in the imagination of the Greeks for many centuries, and it gave them the notion that control of the sea would be critical to enhancing power and prestige. And we'll see that to the Greeks, particularly the Athenians, okay, the Athenians located here, and we'll explore them in greater detail certainly a little later on. But uh, for the Athenians, uh, they become very much enamored of this idea of controlling the Aegean, and that will be something of a driving imperative. So let us proceed by taking a more detailed look at some of the characteristics of this Minoan civilization. And now you are alerted to the fact that some of these Minoan characteristics will later be borrowed by the Mycenaean Greeks as the Mycenaeans come into contact with the Minoans in the 16th and 15th centuries BCE. Now, in looking at Minoan society, uh, the scholars who study the archaeology and study the history of Crete and Minoan civilization have subdivided the history of the Minoans into three periods based on whether or not structures, dwellings known as palaces, and uh, here you see an aerial view of uh, Arthur Evans's excavations at Canossos. All right, you can see how vast and sophisticated these ruins are. Well, this is the quintessential palace complex, and that's uh, what we'll be referring to where you have a central courtyard surrounded by hundreds of rooms. And in the case of Knossos, or the buildings were five stories high. So for its time, and again, we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, 2000 BCE, uh, for its time, this was just a marvel of architecture and engineering. And again, these complexes contain not only many rooms, but many storage chambers. And if you remember what I said uh, earlier about uh, the type of economic model we'll be looking at when we look at the Minoans, this idea of a redistributive model, well, these palaces have got to have enormous amounts of storage space. This points to an institutional organizational concept within Minoan society that is going to be a defining feature. Now, it has never been firmly established whether Minoan Crete had a true royal dynasty. So these palaces, and there are several of them placed throughout the island of Crete, we'll take a look at a map in a moment where uh, those that have been excavated are located, but there are several palaces, and they may have had mixed secular and religious roles, acting as civic centers from which to control and distribute raw materials,
um, but they were also likely used to carry out religious rituals and mete out justice. Now, about the palaces, uh, it is important to note that here we get our first indication that the Minoans are going to be very much influenced by the older civilizations that surround them, uh, particularly the Mesopotamian and Egyptian civilizations. In both cases, for Mesopotamia and Egypt, uh, palaces seem to have been politically, economically, and religiously a central feature of these, of these older civilizations. And with the Minoans early on taking to the sea and becoming maritime traders, they would have been exposed to the idea and the reality of palaces. And the speculation is that they took back with them these ideas to Crete and began to organize their society with palaces being the locus of political, economic, and religious life. And if you key in on this icon here that indicates the location of a palace, you see where most of these palaces are located. And uh, you've got maybe one that has been identified uh, in the very western, the northwestern uh, part of, of uh, Crete. And that would correspond somewhere over here. And you could see, you know, maybe not so much... Uh, going on with Greece as Greece is uh, lagging behind the developmental phase but certainly where these palaces are located we're seeing some indication of where the action was and the action of course was Egypt, the Levant and Asia Minor. Now it's interesting to note that all of the Minoan palaces are unfortified uh, there are no walls or other fortifications to protect the palaces from attack. And this has led to all sorts of speculation that the regional palaces uh, were all unified in the sense of not warring on one another um, and that they were not separate or distinct kingdoms but were subordinate entities tied to the main palace at Knossos, that area that Arthur Evans uh, had excavated which is by far the most uh, extensive uh, and largest of these palace complexes. And the other side of the coin is basically that the Minoans were not necessarily peace-loving people. Uh, they just had a more outward projection of power, as I mentioned in the, an earlier slide about this concept of thalassocracy. They could rely on their naval forces and the far-off outposts and colonies that they established throughout the Cyclades Islands. So with a relatively peaceful coexistence on the island of Crete and a powerful navy uh, to shield uh, the Minoans from any foreign invaders, uh, things were good on the island of Crete, and the prosperity and sophistication of the civilization kind of bears that out. So in the unit reading, Martin makes very clear that the palaces were central organizing structures to Minoan society. And we get the distinct impression of this when it's recognized that a massive earthquake destroyed many of the palace structures that were originally built. Now, following this episode of destruction, the Minoans rebuilt. Uh, and these new palaces that they rebuilt uh, seem to have retained the same functions as their predecessors and they even seem to have been built on a more massive scale. So this earthquake itself and of course Crete lies along a very active seismic zone so earthquakes were, were nothing new but this particular earthquake seems to have been quite impressive yet it wasn't enough to knock the Minoans out and uh, they rebuilt uh, their palaces given how important the palaces were to their overall society. And uh, they experienced something of a golden age uh, following the initial catastrophe. So here you see in this image of the floor plan at Canossos, uh, just the hundreds of rooms, and uh, I'll spare you some of these details, but what I would like you to note is that the palaces themselves, not just at Canossos, but all of them, uh, were built around a central courtyard, and we'll talk a little bit about what that may mean uh, here in a moment. 
Now, if any of you have had any exposure at all to the stories of Minoan civilization, uh, you recognize the prominence of the bull. And, of course, the frescoes that have been recovered, this is uh, one of the frescoes recovered at Canossos, we see an example of how the bull had a central focus, likely in Minoan religious ritual, uh, symbolizing uh, probably power uh, and or fertility. And there is some speculation that there may have been an activity like the one pictured here in the fresco, um, a type of bull leaping activity, not necessarily as a sport or a form of entertainment, but as a type of religious ceremony. Now, this is still open to interpretation, uh, but clearly the fresco image, and this is only one of the many bull-themed frescoes uh, recovered during excavations at palace sites, so it looks as if uh, you have a very fit young athlete somehow managing to leap onto the back of a bull and kind of somersault off. Now, the bull leaping rituals were probably performed in that central courtyard I mentioned a moment ago of the palace during specific religious ceremonies. So the bull becomes a very powerful icon of a very powerful civilization. So in the Martin text, uh, Martin spends a lot of time, rightfully so, uh, looking at the economic organization of Minoan civilization. And we believe that the economy, as I mentioned earlier, was based on a model of centralization and redistribution. Uh, this type of economic model can be traced back to the imperial dynasty of Ur III, uh, which developed in Mesopotamia sometime around 2100 BCE. Again, uh, right before the Minoans really began to get themselves together, uh, we had these older models in place in Mesopotamia. And uh, the later adoption by the Minoans of this economic model may be another example of how cultural and political ideas migrate as the peoples of regional civilizations come into contact with one another. So, as Martin explains in your reading, such a system is based upon production quotas that farmers and other craftsmen have to fulfill, and the finished goods and agricultural produce would be brought to the palace, either at Canossos or one of the other palaces scattered throughout Crete, and those goods would later be redistributed back to the population. Now, we can readily comprehend how such an economic system can be used as a tool to maintain political control uh, through the implementation of a type of ranking system. Uh, we know from later civilizations, uh, for example, the Persian Empire, uh, that Persian kings would favor certain groups with a greater distribution of goods and, and food. So this is something that we do see a lot of in the Near Eastern monarchies, and this may have been another Near Eastern influence that helped shape Minoan civilization. So storage. Now these jars are called pithoi, and they are enormous. They stand about 1.7 meters uh, or uh, over half, uh, five and a half feet tall. And they could hold uh, from one to two tons of grain or olive oil or anything that would be brought back to the palace as part of a quota. And the excavations at Canossos and the other palace sites on Crete have found dozens of these containers intact. So we can imagine that there were hundreds and hundreds of these containers uh, located within the palaces uh, to store the goods that the people were required uh, to bring to the palace. And of course, uh, because the economy was based on redistribution and because farmers and craftsmen were required to fulfill uh, certain quotas, you had to keep a certain record of the ingoing and outgoing goods. So this Linear A script, uh, which is Minoan, has not yet been deciphered, but we know it's Minoan, and there is a strong suspicion that this Linear A script was developed to uh, act as a type of bureaucratic record-keeping device. And uh, when the later Greeks, the Mycenaeans, come into contact with the Minoans, they uh, themselves will not only copy the uh, economic system of redistribution, 
but they also will recognize the value of developing uh, a bureaucratic script. And the Greeks, of course, will do that by creating uh, what is known as Linear B. So when we look at imports and exports, uh, Cretan exports consisted uh, of timber and foodstuffs, cloth, and most likely olive oil, as well as finely crafted luxury goods. Now, in exchange, the Minoans imported uh, copper, gold, and silver. So there's a lot going on. This is a very busy graphic, and that's not necessarily a bad thing if I'm trying to emphasize to you just how uh, sophisticated a trade network uh, was, the, the trade network that developed between these uh, regional civilizations. Uh, again, I'm asking you to take a look at our own day and age and uh, now glance backward at what the Minoans were a part of. And we can see some very, very real similarities here. Now, one of the things that uh, I want to point out is, uh, you know, we're looking at the Bronze Age, and bronze is a metal that is uh, comprised of uh, copper and tin uh, mixed together. Now, copper uh, can be found in the Aegean. There are various locations. Uh, you could see finds of copper ingots down here. Uh, on the key, and you could see these icons here indicating copper is uh, relatively plentiful, but tin is not. And it is the Minoans who uh, were responsible for sailing as far away as certainly as Spain, uh, perhaps Britain, uh, into central, uh, the central European areas where tin was present. And so it is the Minoans that provide this crucial resource, and tin was very crucial towards underpinning the whole economic framework of the region. And it is the Minoans that are going to have uh, the maritime uh, capability of uh, locating uh, sources of tin and trading with the, uh, the people there and bringing tin back where it can be used in the manufacture of bronze and continue to fuel the entire Bronze Age. And so we see that next hundred years after the earthquake, there are indications that there was a golden age for the Minoans. But then, of course, uh, nature will strike again, and this time in the form of a massive volcanic eruption that occurs, we think, sometime around 1625 BCE. And the volcanic eruption will take place here on the island of Thera, uh, nowadays called uh, Santorini. So as you can see from this map, Thera is in very close proximity to Crete, uh, certainly the northern coast of Crete. And uh, with this massive volcanic eruption and uh, the accompanying tsunami that inevitably would have uh, occurred, uh, this must have a, had a de devastating effect on the island of Crete, uh, certainly that northern coast. And while it did not wipe out Minoan society, uh, the Minoans were likely wounded by this devastating event. Uh, the volcanic ash drifting onto Crete uh, would have resulted in, a, in just a devastating impact on agriculture on the island itself. And the uh, tsunami would have uh, really uh, done uh, much damage to the ports and the naval infrastructure uh, of those key uh, northern Minoan seaports. So if the Theron volcano erupts sometime around 1625 BCE, we do get a sense that the Minoans are going to continue on uh, in a weakened state. But ultimately, they become very vulnerable and will be overtaken by those Mycenaean Greeks. So we'll look at Mycenaean civilization in the next lecture, but we can see on this map that Mycenae, after which the Mycenaeans are named, uh, sits on the Peloponnesian Peninsula in what is mainland Greece. And the Mycenaeans uh, will be the ones that ultimately will take control of the island of Crete and those Minoan possessions, uh, territories throughout the Aegean. We know this because at the palace at Knossos, Linear B tablets, Linear B being a Greek script, have been recovered dating from post-1450 BCE.
So scholars believe that around 1450 BCE, and that would be about 150 years after the volcanic eruption uh, at Thera, that Minoan civilization was overtaken by the Mycenaeans. Now, how this took place is open to speculation. Uh, Mycenaeans may have developed a pretty thriving trade network of their own and came into competition with the Minoans and decided that there's only room for one dominant player and decided, when the time was right, to make their move against the Minoans, implementing a hostile takeover based on this economic competition. So more on that as we uh, next turn to the Mycenaeans in the uh, second video lecture for this unit.